What up, YouTube? Welcome back to the tavern. Glad you're here. Grab a cold one or just, just grab one in general. Start sipping. Let's get into it. Today, we are going to be going over part three of the best and worst picks in your dynasty startup for 2024. I am joined by my good friend and fellow content creator, Phil Ruskin of The Extra Point FFB. Phil, how we doing? Good, man. How are you doing? I like the jacket today, dude. You're looking, you're looking sharp. Yeah, and normally I, I kind of look like a scrub with uh, with the basement <laughs> t-shirt kind of kind of vibe. Like, is it my wife upstairs or is it possibly my grandmother? Who knows? Maybe both if I'm really hyper unlucky. Right. But no, I promise I have a day job. I'm, I'm reasonable to mediocre at it, um, but they let me wear a suit. So well, there hey, you go, at man. You're not, at least you're not wearing a hoodie and a backwards hat, man. I mean, come on. Let's be serious. One of us looks good. The other one looks really sharp. Yeah, but you, uh, you know, like Belichick, we're also a very successful coach. And so you get to wear the hoodie and backwards cap because you've earned it. You've, I don't know. You've that done I'm the put one job the... where that's an actual suit and tie uniform. You know, I appreciate it. But let's not put me in the Belichick category. So <laughs> I don't know, man. You check him out on that roast. He was actually kind of funny. That's yeah, for another. You know what? I'm not going to. I was going to say, let's jump into some content. But low key, I was nervous and he honestly kind of killed it i'm gonna I, i'm not a bill check guy but i was like all right bill i see you yeah yeah by the way bill if you're somehow if i am lucky enough to be in your ecosystem one day and you ever watch this i would be super honored to have you on the show wouldn't it be sick to do like a fantasy football thing with bill Dude, Belichick and go for like fantasy value versus like real nfl talk i would edelman <laughs> get into fantasy football and get belichick on the show my god i'm in i'll pay my for it. sister's old job she did all this like social media stuff for his company and like all they did was provide food to stadiums around the country and so she was at all these different stadiums throughout the year and one of the events that they hosted was kentucky derby they did a ton and ton of food there and so she's in there with all the celebs and you know they're she's doing content stuff bill belichick walks in walks right up to her he's like hi i'm bill and she kind of looked at him like no shit, i know who you are you know like but like to him he's just like a normal dude like hey i'm bill and she was like uh-huh yeah no kidding but yeah we always joke about like my sister julia's friend bill and uh you know, she's uh, my sister is one of those people that thinks that you should date age appropriately, which I think most people probably agree with. There's a gap. So now that he has a 24 year old girlfriend or however old she is, and he's like, what, like 70, she's like completely ripped. I'm like, still your friend, Bill. Look at this guy. So anyway, not the Bill Belichick variety hour, but I just thought it was funny. I'd share that. I'll, with I'll you. get one last <laughs> jive in. I, I know he's like 70. Tell me if I told you right now he was like 48 years old, you'd be like, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. Bill's <laughs> just, coaches age, age coaches age differently, man. Yes. They age differently. I, as the life of our of our podcast and, and YouTube channels go on, we'll we'll see if you if you start growing Gandalf gray hair going on, we'll we'll know that coaching is uh, hey, is a different breed, man. I, I just shaved the beard, man. I haven't seen my face in like three years. I shaved it last night, and I was like, okay, I think I look a little bit. Yeah, I still look old, but a little bit younger. Anyway, let's do some football, man. Let's get hey, let's get into some football. <laughs> All right. All right. So I uh, got a quick shout out to our good friends, not sponsors. We pay them. Actually, I give them money. They give me no discounts, but the great friends over at Dynasty League Football. Uh, they run a great shop, good content, good stuff. They provide uh, Dynasty startup ADP from their mock drafts that they run. This is their ADP set from uh, May. No, not May. Actually, This is from uh, June. So it's not the most recent, but it's what I have prepared and it's close enough. So we're going to go with it. If this is how the board falls, these are generally we're talking about the general best and worst picks based on ADP. ADP changes all the time. It hasn't changed a ton. You're going to see some players where in your mock drafts, you're like, wait, he goes way higher. We're talking relative here. So if a pick we love just it seems unrealistic to you. Again, you get the general idea. We're, we're, that's why we're also doing some some honorable mentions so that you still get the general idea of the best and worst ranges uh, in each round per me and Phil, which is just objectively true. So listen to us. And uh, we're going to start, uh, if you haven't seen our other couple of videos, go check them out uh, uh, on our channels. We're going to start, we're going to do rounds 7, 8, 9, and 10, getting uh, uh, getting us into the double digits. Uh, so I'm going to kick us off. Let's jump into it. Round 7, starting with Josh Jacobs at the 7-1, according to DLF ADP. Um, my favorite and best pick in this round is right there, uh, James Cook at the 7-5. 
I think he's a little bit mispriced here at the seven five. I see him go consistently in the sixth round, but maybe I'm just drafting with people that like running backs more than consensus. Um, if Cook ever falls to the seventh, even at the seven one, I absolutely love him. He, he's a nice combination of he's in a great offense. He's a talented player. He's versatile. He can catch passes. And he also did his best mini Derrick Henry impression last year where he secretly had this a ridiculous, well, almost like 13, 1400 yards from scrimmage. It was, it was a lot. Um, I think he can do it all. The coaching staff wanted to get him involved more last year. They talked about it in, in the preseason and then it happened. Um, so I do think he got some competition that came in, but James Cook is just a wonderful combination of good offense. The defense got a little bit more porous, which we don't love, but he is also a pass catcher, which is fine. Uh, he had one of the, the the worst streaks of like touchdown unluckiness that'll happen when you're playing with Josh Allen. Uh, but I don't think it sticks forever. I think he, he his uh, touchdown, actually he could regress uh, in a positive fashion and maybe add one or two from whatever he did last year. Um, so combination of safe floor, guaranteed role, high powered offense, uh, high powered offense gives you some ceiling potential. It helps when you're also talented. Combine the two. I think he is a smash pick in the seventh round. And my quick worth mentioning is Brian Thomas Jr. I know he was known for nine routes, uh, uh, you know, over at uh, at LSU, but I do think he's going to evolve into a pretty good wide receiver for Jacksonville. They desperately need a one who can do a lot of things. Uh, and I think even in year one, he could take a pretty big step in the Jacksonville offense and make us completely forget Gabe Davis, which we'd all probably be thankful for. So I'm going to throw him a little bit of love too. Phil, who do you like yeah. uh, in uh, round seven? Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest uh, as we were chatting before the show, right? James Cook and BTJ would have been my guys as well. So I'll just add this really, really quickly. James Cook has four rushing touchdowns in his entire career. We know Josh Allen's the goal line back. We know Ray Davis uh, is the new Latavius Murray. They like that bigger body back, but I anticipate positive touchdown regression, just like you said. Look, if he can get a thousand yards again this season, I think that's the floor that we're expecting, and he can get to six to eight touchdowns, RB one all day. So love James Cook. Um, I took a different route here, and and I took the uh, obviously I said I would have had Cook and BTJ, but I took Jane Reed, and and the reason I say that simply is look, it is crowded in um, Green Bay. We we get it. There's a lot of mouths to feed, but this is the I believe it is now the second or third youngest offense. It was the youngest offense last year. And I think I just saw a stat the other day that said they're now the third. Either way, it is one of the youngest offenses in the NFL with a young quarterback with a really good play caller in Matt LaFleur. And while it's crowded, I think the piece for me that's really interesting is Jaden Reed, I think, is the best of the non-X roles. And what I mean is if you have Jaden Reed and you have Dontavian Wicks and you have Romeo Dobbs, I think Reed's the better player out of all three of those. So I think he's most likely to get on the field. Now we know Christian Watson, who can be a great value um, you know, later in drafts. We know what he can be, but the best ability is availability, and he's not always available. So to me, give me Jaden Reed. Um, you know, we we like the now it's, it's in some of your scoring formats, this is kind of a cherry on top. You might get points for return yards. You might get points for touchdowns. There could be some of that with the new kickoff rules. I know he's been talked about. He, he did that at Michigan State. That was his role. Um, so there is a possibility, you know, if you have one of those types of scoring formats, Jaden Reed could give you some of those bonus points. I wouldn't draft him because of that. I think he's going to end up being heavily involved. Um, the other thing I would say about Reed, and this is the other reason I picked him here in the in the seventh round. <coughs> Most of the leagues that I play in, Jaden Reed was a third round rookie pick. And I'm seeing him being sold, if he's being sold right now, for a second or a first. So if Reed has anywhere close to a comparable season this year to what he has next year, and you're the type of fantasy player that wants to capitalize on his value because it's so crowded in Green Bay, because there could be an emergence of another star. Maybe Christian Watson is healthy. Maybe Romeo Dobbs takes that next step. I think you can sell Reed. So it's not just that I like the talent. It's also the fact that I think in the seventh round, I could be trading up to end up getting a player that, you know, we're talking about Brian Thomas Jr. as a rookie in the exact same round. There's rookies you can see on the board that are going much higher. So if I could get a player next year in the draft in exchange for Reed, I paid a third round for him. I'm drafting him in the seventh. It doesn't cost me what uh, what a you know a first round rookie is going to cost me. 
that's somebody that could end up being on my roster next year. So lots of upside there uh, for Jaden Reed in that high scoring offense. The other player that I actually really like here, it's dynasty. So I have to be a little careful about this because there is an age cliff, but to me, it's Derrick Henry and, and I get it. I, nobody really wants Derrick Henry on their roster because of the age, but I play dynasty in a two to three year window. And in the seventh round, I've probably the way I like to build is I'm probably loading up pretty early on my wide receivers. I might take a hero quarterback. I've probably taken a hero RB. So to go get guys that are younger, that have higher ceilings, that I know are going to be staples for my team with youth and longevity and hold value at the wide receiver position, give me Derrick Henry with the touchdown upside in the seventh round as my RB2 or RB3. And I feel really good about that for two years. It's not sexy. It's not James Cook. It's certainly not, you know, Brees Hall or Christian McCaffrey or, or Bijan. And that's obviously not what we're talking about. But if I start my draft with Bijan and then go receiver, 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 because most leagues actually that I'm seeing are transitioning to at least two receivers with multiple flex or most are actually, or sorry, some are now three wide receivers. I'd rather load up on those receivers and go get Derrick Henry late. Um, and I think with the touchdown upside in that offense, it just, it's, a, it's just a safe pick in the seventh round. It's a safe pick. I mean, he is pretty much bus proof. I, uh, I, I, ha I have to give you that. But we'll, uh, we'll argue about, uh, about Derrick Henry here in, uh, in a yeah. minute. I feel, uh, you know, we'll have to get into a deep, a deep argument later on. We'll, 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 we'll touch base on it uh, a little bit here uh, in a second. But interesting. I, let, let, you know, let, let's get to the negative side of things. Worst pick, worst pick in round seven. Let's dive in. Uh, for me. The worst pick in round seven is a player that I, I believe it or not, I actually like. I just think he's ridiculously mispriced here. I think he goes later. If I look at adjusted ADP, he probably goes later. But for those that are a little high on him, uh, Tajay Spears, I like him. Uh, I'm actually starting to like him over uh, Pollard uh, in, in Dynasty. Actually, across all formats, I, I pretty much kind of high on Spears. I just don't love him in the seventh round in a Dynasty startup when there are still very valuable wide receivers and I prefer wide receiver to running back. And the fact that there are still James cooks, Deandre Swift, isn't dead. Trey Benson goes later. There's just other players at the running back position. that I like later that still have some ligaments left in their knee. Now Tajay proved us all wrong. He had no issues. He was fantastic. Maybe he's an outlier and modern medicine's great. And his body's fantastic. He takes care of himself. That being said, I think the position's brutal. Uh, I think he lacks a bit of a ceiling for me any year in Dynasty, and uh, I just like other players better. If I hate a player, I'm going to let you know right away. I don't hate him. I like him. I don't like him in the seventh. I want to wait till the ninth. I don't like most running backs until nine ten. Uh, but he's not enough to make me want to reach a little bit earlier where I would for a James Cook. So Tajay Spears, not my favorite pick in the seventh. It's a little too rich for my blood. My mini honorable mention is, um, I got to be honest, I'm not super in love with Derrick Henry in the seventh, but I do think he makes sense for some particular builds. I will yeah. give, I'll give you credit here, Phil, in that based on the way you're drafting, if you're taking a quarterback or two plus five wide receivers or a quarterback tight end and five wide receivers, and you're doing that type of build, which I've definitely seen you do... Um, every time I've ever drafted with you. Yep. Um, and at that point, depending on where you're, where you're going with it, Henry is a combination of a stabilizing force, bust proof. The only thing that's missing for me, and if he had this um, attribute, I would absolutely take him off like my potential worst pick. And that's, I'm not sure he's super tradable. Like preseason, like if you're, unless you're trading him right now to play this season, I think by the mid to like playoff run. I don't think you're getting a first for him so that you can help someone else's playoff run. They'll want to do it. And if he has the season, I think he does. Maybe you can get it done. So here's where I eat my words. If Derrick Henry is worth a late first round pick to the ultimate title winner later in the year, he's not the worst pick anymore. But if well, he's not, if he's barely sellable for a second in the playoff run, that's where I look slightly to my left. And I say BTJ and James cook go in the same round and they go for, a first, if not a fir like 1.5 firsts, and Derrick Henry isn't even worth one first in the same round. If I'm correct in my assumption, it's a pretty big value disparity in the same round. And so I'm just bringing that out. Now, if you win your title with Derrick Henry, throw value out the window, go buy me a drink, and I'm all about it. And that's Who's your worst. I think for me, just the last piece, and I pulled this real quick, it's not someone I'm building around. 
I think it's valuable in the right build, exactly what you said. And I'll tell you this. I had Derrick Henry in a league, and I did get a trade done. I was shocked I got this trade done. But Derrick Henry, Jerry Judy, and a third is what I sent away. I got a 2024 second and a 2025 first back. So it was a guy that wanted him. It was a guy that was excited. It was right after Jerry Judy was traded to the Browns. And it was also when Derrick Henry was very much rumored to be going to the Ravens. I don't know if he'd actually signed when I got this trade done. I remember putting Judy on the, excuse me, uh, yeah, putting Judy on the block that day. And I got the trade done that same day. So I was very excited by that. And I have to go back and look what I actually ended up drafting here with that second round pick. But yeah, it was, uh, I feel like a win for me. So um, my worst pick is going to be Matt Stafford here. And it's, this could be Matt Stafford's last year in the league. Um, and I'll just say this quite quickly. I actually think the Rams offense is going to be pretty good this year. But we're talking dynasty. We're not talking redraft. Um, very simply, if it's a one quarterback league, Matt Stafford's not making my team. If it's a two quarterback league, I would only take him if it was the third quarterback in a super flex two quarterbacks, you know, uh, format. I just don't trust that he's going to be around next season and if he is what does he have left is cooper cup going to be around yes what does he have left is puka going to be you know still maintaining this high target share probably but i think the writing's on the wall for the rams to start getting younger at quarterback and you know i think for me look they're a playoff team i think they have the potential to be a playoff team anyway so they're probably not getting one of the top rookies there's not really a great option for um free agents next year outside of Dak Prescott which don't rule that out uh, I think Dak Prescott could wind up anywhere and we know the Rams like to make big crazy trades but I just see a bridge coming after Stafford it could be Joe Flacco for a you know I mean it could be one of these Winston Flacco you know some of these guys could be a, a, a you know third or fourth round rookie quarterback but I like Stafford you know if you have to take him as like a bye week fill-in if you're on the waiver wire and redraft but I'm, I'm out in dynasty it just doesn't make sense um worth mentioning is gonna maybe be a spicy take for some not for me but for others and it's jsn and i i just with the new coach coming in mike mcdonald and what they did in baltimore i think that you're gonna see more of a balanced attack whereas Pete carroll was pretty run heavy you know new washington or excuse me the new seattle uh coordinator offensive coordinator is from washington so i think they're gonna throw it more than they have but Tyler Lockett just got two more years on his deal. DK Metcalf, DK Metcalf is still the alpha in that offense. He's the wide receiver one. So to me, it's JSN has to take targets away from Tyler Lockett. And the one thing, look, anybody can get hurt on any play. We know that. But Tyler Lockett, if you watch football, and you and I watch a lot of football, he catches the ball and he gets down. That's why he's been able to play for as many years as he has. Is he'll find a spot, soft spot in the zone. He'll catch it. If there's yak, you know, he's not a yak guy. He's not Debo. He's not built that way. So he catches it and goes down a lot of the time and has preserved his body and has preserved his health. To me, I traded JSN. I got a first and a second for him back. I feel fine about that trade. I'll be honest. I feel really good about that because at the end of the day, I'm trading a rookie receiver for basically a rookie receiver. That's what I'm going to end up taking with that first round pick. Um, and I just, I just, I have a hard time right now seeing the path where barring injury, JSN just completely overtakes Tyler Lockett. New coaching staff could be different. Um, but then you look in the seventh round here, I would rather have Brian Thomas Jr. over JSN. I mean, that's 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 where I'm at. Whereas we get into the next round here in the eighth, we're going to talk about a couple of players. I won't ruin it for us, but we're going to talk about a couple of uh, players in the next round. I'd rather have both of them over JSN. So I don't think it's a bad pick by any means. I just think we're talking about values best and worst values in this round to me there's more valuable players later and i if i'm on the clock depending on what my team build looks like i'd take james cook over jsn in this round two picks later so yeah i like it let's get on to run eight shall we let's do it all right my favorite and objectively the greatest pick ever in round eight i'm going my boy lad mcconkey now i say this with a little bit of grain of salt because i i i'm also pretty high in my boy brock bowers and lad was kind of wide receiver to brock bowers a couple of times but he is the best pick in this round because college is great nfl is a whole different beast and players become something much different okay and when i look at what lad mcconkey showed on the field and what i think 
he's going to be for the Chargers. I think he's basically going to be a slightly light version of what Cooper Cup does for the Los Angeles Rams. I think he very much has the ability, the way he plays, his body type. I think he can be a power slot player that can move around in the formation a little bit, but that's kind of where he can live. Uh, I think him and Herbert are going to connect early and often. I don't see a ridiculous amount of 100-yard games, but I see a lot of seven, eight, nine catches for 70, 80 yards. And in a PPR format, I think he is going to absolutely eat. I think when they can't run through the ground, they still want to run the ball. So they're going to run through the air with McConkey. They're going to move the chains. Great they're going to get into the red zone and McConkey is going to absolutely eat. He's going to look like a young Keenan Allen, not quite the crisp route runner that Keenan Allen became, but I do think McConkey can do some pretty nice things in, in uh, yards after the catch and his contact balance. So I love him in the eighth. He's upside. Even if he's the wide receiver two in the chargers, he's still going to be amazing here. And that's his floor. And he only gets better. My honorable mention, Deandre Swift. He is getting up in age, but he's a pass catching specialist. He had a better than average year last year on a team that basically never let him score a touchdown in the goal line, unless Jalen hurts was still figuring out the signal calling. And I think, you know, for a guy that is supposed to be a pass catching explosive guy, he did a very good James Cook impression last year of just pounding the rock, finding a gap, getting his yardage, and not complaining about it. I think he grew up a little bit last year, and I think Chicago saw that and got him at a value when if he wasn't the same player that was trying to hit 100 yards on every single play and bounce it to the outside, I think he's matured enough that Chicago can do not amazing things with him, but I think he's going to pay off his ADP, and he's going to pay it off long enough because he's being drafted like Chicago is going to be the Chicago of the last three to five years and not Chicago of the next three to five years, which is going to be a much different situation. Uh, and I think you're going to be surprised by how consistently valuable he is in that offense. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Don't have anything else to add on those. I love what you just said though, about lab McConkey is that how the chargers are going to run through the air. That was magic. That was, that was a great take. I love it. Um, for me, it's Keon Coleman and, and look, Quentin Johnston is not on this board, which means he's not going in the first 120 picks. And he was a first round wide receiver. So a year from now, there is a world, there is a path where we are saying Keon Coleman is garbage. He's a bust. Well, how, how did you not see this coming? And the truth is, is that hindsight bias is very real, especially in fantasy. On the opposite side of that coin, we have to make the decisions based on the information we have today. And what we know today is that Khalil Shakir is 24 years old and has been in Buffalo, and he's been good, not great. Steph Diggs is gone. Gabe Davis is gone. It's a 42% market share. It's 315 targets. I've said ad nauseum on this show, on my own show, how I believe that Dalton Kincaid and James Cook are the big winners in the Steph Diggs trade away because they are both obviously Kincaid, but Cook's speciality is as a pass catcher and not a rushing touchdown guy. But where are the rest of those targets going to go? Because Curtis Samuel's 28 years old, and I get it, Joe Brady, it's his guy, and he knows him. But to me, Curtis Samuel is a rental. Keon Coleman is a contested catch specialist. He's a big body wide receiver. He can play the X. He's young. He's got time to learn and mature and grow in a Josh Allen-led offense. And I think if you can sit here and say, oh, well, Coleman's going to be a bust, and how did you not see it coming? You could easily make the case, and I am making the case. I see the path for him to be extremely successful. And if it works the way that we think it will, you are not getting Keon Coleman in the eighth round next year. You'll never get him at this price again. It'll be inside easily the top five rounds, probably inside the top 36 wide receivers. He may be going at the back of the third, early fourth round. So to get somebody who in an offense that we know and we believe in, but we've seen before, to get a player in that type of an offense where the path is there for him, to me, it's a great value. It's a great pick. Um, I, I wasn't super, I'll be honest. I wasn't super high on Coleman coming out. I had some questions about him as I've done my homework, as I've watched film, as I've studied, I like him. I think he's going to work. I think he's going to be really good. And in the eighth round, give me Keon Coleman all day. The other one I think is interesting is it's, it's a caveat. And even if you, you can't see our show doc, but it's got a couple asterisks next to it. It's Rasheed Rice and I get it. Rasheed Rice is scary. We don't know what the suspension is going to look like. We don't even know if there is going to be a suspension. We assume there will be. It could be two games. It could be four. It could be 12. It could be the whole season. But unless it's the whole season and Xavier Worthy just emerges, if it's a four-game suspension, Rasheed Rice is going to be fine. And 
you're not going to get him at this price later. And I and I say that it's a caveat because if Rasheed Rice hadn't gotten in trouble, he wouldn't be here in the eighth round. It's not. He wouldn't. He'd at least be two rounds higher. It's Patrick Mahomes' number two weapon. We haven't seen Xavier Worthy catch a pass yet. There is some risk built in there. We have seen Rice. So to me, I have Rasheed Rice. I'm holding. I'm not trading him. I'm not trading for him. I'm not trading him away. I'm just holding and kind of, you know, purg- NFL purgatory. Um, but I say this again with a grain of salt. If you can get Rasheed Rice as a late round flyer, as your wide receiver four or five, take the shot because the upside is built in. It's gross, but it's also not gross, you know, <laughs> but bu- buying the troublemaker on, uh, you know, like the Steelers or something like that, or the Jets would uh, would be rough. Uh, but Kansas City, if you're going to buy in on a troublemaker, I mean, that's uh, that's where I'm going with it. Let me so. let me just pause really quick. Let me ask you this question. Who would you rather have right now? Rasheed Rice or Jordan Addison? Jordan Addison. OK. Because Jordan Addison just. Man, he had the speeding incident last year. He had the DUI this year. He's he's drinking again yesterday on Instagram. Like, I mean, dude's got I main Kevin O'Connell might need to drive over to Mr. At, drive the speed limit wearing a seatbelt over to Mr. Addison's house and say, come with me, young man. You're gonna live in the facility for a while. <laughs> hey man, I, I don't I, I don't doubt that he needs a little bit of that, but I think it's a big difference. Okay. Yeah. When he saw sure. them flashing lights, he took one more shot and said, It's gonna be a late night. Take me in. <laughs> he fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> he All was right, just listen. you know what i'm saying like he just said all right well this is what happens next she rice panicked like a 12 year old and ran yeah, yeah, there's no a big doubt. difference all right one guy no said doubt. look it's the preseason and by the way i already did my thing my rookie year and it was a lot better than yours so That's hey true. you know what you gotta you gotta earn your your right to go screw around a little bit and you have <laughs> not yet um but you know he's got more rings than i do over there rashi so good for you um let's keep it moving where are we at here? We are on worst, uh, worst, eight. worst round eight. Hate to say it. Love the player. Hate him in dynasty. Keenan Allen. Don't waste your pick. Yeah. Unless you're going to win the league this year and you better win the league this year. And everyone who's ever said that has a story for you that doesn't end so well. Uh, I, I, I can't justify him in the eighth when there are players that arguably could finish adjacent to him uh, and still have 10 more years uh, in the NFL. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous that he's going there. Um, I get it. There's a lot of like, well, what we've forgotten that changing teams is usually a net negative, not a net positive. We just forgot because the last couple of times it's worked out. Okay. It usually doesn't. Uh, and I think this is the time where it's going to work out. Okay. For the NFL, not for fantasy. Um, I think he's going to be serviceable, but there's just not going to be enough volume for him to truly eat and to have a truly elite enough ceiling that you can get what you paid for, for a season and a half at the 811 if i'm proven wrong i will go i will go buy a signed keen allen jersey immediately and say this this man is something special doing what he's doing at his age and i hope he does I, if you can see in the background i'm a diehard bears fan i want him to be it i'm just not paying that price uh in dynasty again i think he's productive but i don't think i think it's a floor play not a ceiling play and he's just way too old to have any relevance he is he is an injury followed by half of an injury away from being Mike Williams. And that's that's too much. I just don't love him in Dynasty. Love the player, and I hope he crushes it and helps the Bear the Bears transition a little bit. My honorable mention is Alvin Kamara. Hate Alvin Kamara at the 810. Hate him in Dynasty. I tell you what, I hate him in redraft this year. And I was pretty high on him. I was buying the dip last year in redraft. My quick take on Kamara is he is a floor play. Um, in a round where you want to start looking at upside. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense for me. I think he's going to lose some early down work uh, to other running backs. Like, And I say other running backs because I don't know who, but it will be one of several, and it could even be a tight end. Um, I don't think he gets the same passing game usage because they're going to have to evolve the offense to not include him because he might not be there for very much longer, and they're going to have to do something with it. Um so the fact that his goal line vulture, he, he gets goal line vultured from the weird offense where sometimes Taysom gets in. He yeah. gets vultured from early down work. He's really just a pass catching uh, specialist. Um, so he's similar to Eckler, but he's going in the eighth when really he should go side by side with Eckler in likely the 11th. And he's just getting the Camara name bump where we haven't officially put him into purgatory with Eckler where he belongs. Um and he is not nearly talented enough at this point in his career on a dreadful offense to be dr- drafted 
uh, at the 810 when you can still have DeAndre Swift at the 812. And then you got Zamir White, Trey Benson, even like when you're making Najee Harris look like a good dynasty asset, you, you need to pass. And uh, yeah, not feeling him at the 810. Who's your worst? Yeah, 694 rushing yards last year at age 28. So not that much younger than Eckler. So um, my worst is is interesting. And I just was taking some quick notes here. My worst is Michael Penix Jr. And, and look, it, let me say this because it's important. Michael Penix Jr. is a good football player. If Michael Penix Jr. had not gotten drafted to the Falcons, I had him as my QB3 coming out in this class. I had him ahead of McCarthy. I had him ahead of May. Now, I think the athleticism of May eventually will will outwin what it, what we expect to see from Penix because of the age and Penix's documented injury history. But from a quarterback ready to step into an NFL role, that's how I saw it. Now, obviously, going to the Falcons just, just killed it. Um, here's why I think it's a bad pick. In a single quarterback league, I only want Penix as my on my taxi squad. I just don't need him. And I just looked up. I have Penix in two places. Um, I have Penix in a single quarterback lead where my quarterbacks are Anthony Richardson. And then I used the 203 to draft Jaden Daniels this year because I had Derek Carr as my backup. So I was able to replace Carr with Daniels. Um, Penix was a ridiculous value in the third round. So I grabbed him and I'm stashing him on my taxi squad. It's a single quarterback league. My hope is that he does develop in the next two years. And I never want anything to happen to players. But if Kirk Cousins isn't healthy and Penix has to play, then I can trade him because I feel great with Richardson and Daniels. I don't want you to burn the pick. It's the same thing you just said about Kamara. In a single quarterback league, don't burn the pick on Penix. It, trade for him later if he develops or trade for him next season if it's you know an early trade to get in early before the price goes higher. It's just a burn because unless Cousins is hurt, he's not playing this season for sure. And the guy's old. So it's a challenge. In a super flex league, I have Penix um, with a, in a quarterback. Excuse me. My quarterbacks are Kyler Murray and Jalen Hurts with Derek Carr on my bench. So, and that was a startup. Uh, so I didn't have to use any rookie picks. Carr is going to play for two years. The contract says that he's going to play for two years. If Penix is the guy in the next two years, I have a backup for Kyler Murray and Jalen Hurts. If he doesn't, then whatever. It's on my taxi squad. It doesn't hurt me. But in the eighth round, we've already talked about the guys that we like. I would take all of those skill position players over over Penix, the quarterback. Um, and honestly, I, I would probably take a couple flyers on a couple of other quarterbacks as well. Um, the other one is Aaron Rodgers. And it's a very, it's almost carbon copy, rinse and repeat of what I just said about Matt Stafford. He's 38 years old, which is interesting. I'm going to make this argument because it could be a Kirk Cousins. <laughs> you could just insert the name Kirk Cousins. But he's 38 years old, coming off of an Achilles. We don't know how much longer he's going to play. The Jets win now window is closing. I know that doesn't sound what Jets fans want to hear because they haven't had their win now window open, but Aaron Rodgers didn't play last year. He played five snaps. So to me, again, in a super flex league, you're basically only getting Rodgers for this season. Maybe, maybe next year, but that's risky. Um, I, I'd rather have Justin Fields. You know what I mean? Like, I'd rather have the shot on Justin Fields with the youth, the athleticism. He's not a great quarterback, but at the end of the day, guy runs. And I mean, if you can't beat Russell Wilson out of a job, then maybe you really don't deserve to be in the league. You know what I mean? So I think to me, Penix and Rogers find a better pick in the eighth round. We've talked about the guys we liked. And as, as you and I transition to the ninth round, I would take these guys we like in the ninth over both those players as well. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And uh, to, to, to follow up on your Penix pick, uh, uh, just two things. One, if you're in a league where the entire league somehow pays up through five, six seasons, okay, fine. That's kind of, we've all agreed we're all in this for the super long haul. Okay, maybe we're starting there. But let me just tell you this, right? By the time Penix is a good pick, Justin Fields is going to be a better pick around later. So if you're planning on waiting that long for Penix to do his thing, you probably just take Justin Fields and get a better you know, asset, um, at least is, what, what I think is going to happen with fields over the next, you know, two, three years when he, when he, ta when he, when he takes over, he's already 24. I mean, well, here's a, I Penix is Penix older than fields. <laughs> yeah. Penix is, so like, this is what's wild. Ready? I'll, I'll give you this. So in four years, in four years, Michael Penix, sorry, Michael Penix is 24 years old today. In two years, he will be 26 and probably out of the league. In two years, Anthony Richardson will only be 24. 
<laughs> That's what I mean. Like Jaden Daniels only be 23. So like these oh, guys that are man. starters that have been in the league are going to still be younger with actual NFL game experience before Penix ever in less crazy injuries and before Penix ever takes a snap. What a That's wild tough. ride. Penix's private life probably is because he hears all someone these not lose. It. How did so- <laughs> first of all, let's just say this. I feel terrible for the kid because you waited your whole life to be drafted and you got mm-hmm. drafted in the in the top 10. How did someone in Atlanta not lose a job over this pick? I mean, we don't have time for that, but we'll talk about that on another show. Let's get into the ninth round. But yeah, you know, man. We'll, we'll, we might have to talk about that in your show a little bit. We'll, uh, yeah, maybe. we'll get we'll there. See. We'll see if we get there. Yeah. <laughs> all right, man. Round nine, best pick by far in round nine because he doesn't go in the round nine anymore. I don't think, but he's getting slept on a little bit. And I've seen him there a little bit. Um, I think a newer ADP he probably goes uh, mid, mid eighth to late eighth, but Trey Benson is the best pick in round nine. My goodness. Do I love me some Trey Benson, right? Before Brooks started getting really steamed up as like the clear and away RB one in this class. There was a lot of like, is it Brooks? Is it Benson? Who's RB one? It was going back and forth. Uh, he got drafted to what, already was at times an explosive offense going to get a lot better with all the, you know, the weapons added to it. Um, they could put up a lot of points. That's going to be good for Benson. Uh, I think he can do a little bit of Jameer Gibbs light where he doesn't need a high snap share because of his ability to catch passes and be very explosive. Uh, I think he functions similar like a Tony Pollard where actually a small snap share allows him to consistently be uh, what he needs to be on that play keeping his, uh, his yards per touch a very high, his, uh, his explosive, uh, breakout run of 20 plus, uh, should be pretty good. Uh, I like him. Um, I I'm farther down on him this year than a lot of people are. A lot of people are like, you know, he could be a late season winner. I think, you know, I think he actually stays RB two all season long. And I think that is perfectly okay because I think as RB two, he might outscore the RB one in fantasy. He'll be the yes. RB two in the NFL. He might be the RB one in fantasy, similar to a Gibbs Montgomery. It's my favorite analogy is, and honestly it works really well for Connor too, because Connor and Montgomery have a very similar style. They can be bruising. They can do a lot of things They're, They've got some fundamentals occasionally get banged up. Um, and so Trey Benson is my much cheaper version Less talented, albeit, but uh, he, he's got some aspects to Jameer Gibbs. I like running backs who don't need 60% snap share to be valuable because the running back landscape is becoming, you know, everybody is in a mixed backfield. I want a guy that in a mixed backfield, it doesn't matter. They're still great. And I think he can do that for a long time. Love Trey Benson. My honorable mention is Ramondre Stevenson. Uh, I still like Ramondre. I, I'm buying the dip here. He got a contract, so at a minimum, running backs of his age, our biggest question mark is, what is their future? What does yep. even next year look like, right? Next year. And, you know, he got enough money that while the offense is bad, I think we all think it's only going to get better, and it could get a lot better uh, in a division whose offenses are getting a lot better uh, to a team that might play a more interesting version of football compared to what they have been. Um, and I think it is significantly down year last year. When, you know, similar to remember Najee Harris's rookie year, yep. much different player, except I think Ramondre based on how he's used can still get back to those good pass catching days because I think they'll have an offense that's worth being in games occasionally and still throwing the ball a little bit. And I think Ramondre definitely stands to benefit. They've got a lot of rookies uh, at wide receiver. They just have two billion wide receivers in general. Um but if the rookies get playing time, they're inexperienced. He'll actually be one of the the veterans that can just consistently see targets, see yep. touches. Um, you know, I don't think he's a massive upside guy anymore. I don't see that. But I think in terms of how safe the floors are, Zamir White could be irrelevant much faster than an older Ramondre Stevenson in a similar round. And so that's why I'm a little bit elevated on Ramondre. Don't love him, but I certainly don't hate him. And I think he is a definition of a value. Who do you like? Yeah, agreed. I like those takes. Um, To me, this is where the real definition of value comes into play, because while these two players that I'm going to talk about may not be the sexiest players at their position, they are mispriced. And and here's I'm going to start with George Kittle. George Kittle's getting older. We we get it. We know it. And, you know, the the days are I won't say numbered, but right. George is 30 years old. So he's a year older than Mark Andrews, excuse me, two years older than Mark Andrews. Um, you know, Kelsey is an anomaly. Kelsey's 32, 33 years old, right? So I think George probably has two to three years left. George Kittle finished his tight end five. He had the uh, most receiving yards in the NFL last year out of any tight end. He was the only tight end last season 
to break a thousand yards. And he did it on 90 targets. So he got 30 targets less than Kelsey. He got 60, 50 targets less than Ingram. Uh, and he got 30 targets less than um, Sam Laporta, who was the number one tight end. And Sam Laporta, keep in mind, scored 10 touchdowns. So on 120 targets, he went for 889 and 10. Uh, Kittle was 963. Excuse me. I'm looking at Evan Ingram here. Um, Kittle, I just lost him. Where did he go? It's 1020 on the yardage. Uh, and then I have to find his. Give me one second. There it is. 1020 and six. So this is an offense that is arguably the number one offense, if not the second best offense in the NFL in a very, very crowded room. But the price that you are paying for Mark Andrews, Sam Laporta, Trey McBride in a dynasty startup, we've already covered these players and you can see them on the board here. Mark Andrews in the fifth, Dalton Kincaid in the sixth. You can see barely at the top of the screen there in the third round, uh, Sam Laporta in the fourth round, Trey McBride. Now I get it. He outperformed these players last year, Kittle, other than Laporta. It could be a very different argument uh, this season in terms of fantasy finish. But we're talking about what you're looking for from a tight end is ceiling. George Kittle can win you a week. You know, if you're watching receiver right now on a Netflix, he had three touchdowns on his birthday. And I'm pretty sure he's had three catches and all three were touchdowns. So, right, like it's it's you know, you're going to get some weeks with Kittle where he's going to disappear. But that's true of most receivers. And you could talk about Devontae Adams disappearing last week and then or disappearing on weeks and then just coming back and getting you absolute crushing weeks. In the ninth round, and I'm usually a pretty on brand for me, a late round drafter. Give me George Kittle and give me a young Ben Sinnott real late. And I'll take Kittle for two years and hope Sinnott develops into my tight end of the future so that I'm not having to pay a premium, you know, for a McBride, for an Andrews, for a Laporta. Um, I just think in the ninth round, you're not going to find a ceiling performance like that of someone who can finish in the top five at their position that late consistently. And George Kittle will give you that. Um, the other one that I like here is, is actually right next to him on the board. It's Christian Watson. Look, Christian Watson's had his injuries. He's been out of the lineup. He went to some sort of a, you know, medical Institute to do a, you know, full study on his hamstring and found out that he had less tensile strength or something, 30% less. And I, I don't know all the numbers off the top of my head, but basically he says he's fixed it. It's cut that number in half. He's at like 15% difference between his legs. And ideally he'd like to get down to six or seven. Look, the truth is, is that Christian Watson is the X. He's the alpha in that offense when healthy. He had seven touchdowns his rookie season and five last year in half, basically almost half as many games. So when he's on the field, he's great. And that's always been his biggest issue. But again, in the ninth round, give me the upside of a guy that is a different body type and a different archetype than the rest of the receivers in that room attached to Jordan Love. And at 6'4", 208, can he go and do some, you know, some of the Mike Evans contested ball situations in the end zone? That's where Mike Evans has made a living. I think Christian Watson obviously can take the top off of defense, but he can also score touchdowns and touchdowns win fantasy games. So in the ninth, give me Kittle, give me Watson, and I'm very happy. I like it. Those are two guys that would have definitely been on my list as well. Uh, Kittle still loves football. Guys get older, they fall out of love uh, with the game. They're independently wealthy. Uh, getting beat up for money uh is 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 less fun at that point and i think that that takes a toll mentally i think first mentally it goes and that drains into the physicalness and just it, it affects everything you watch him on receiver and that's obviously we, we always we knew who he was before receiver sure. i think people that have that youthful mentality he's playing a kid's game he knows it and he is super happy about it every second of every day i think that's actually going to keep him a year or two younger physically and mentally than everyone else. And I do think that gives him a year or two shelf life longer than everyone else. Just take his age, subtract two from it and pretend that's his real age. And I think that's honestly a really a good way of looking at where he is in his career and what he'll do. And then all of a sudden makes him not some old guy. Um, and I think he is way sneaky good. So uh, love him. You already know. I love Christian Watson. Everything I would say is everything you have said, but Kittle really, really sneaky. Like him a lot. Let's get to the ugly round nine. Ugly, nasty boys. Najee Harris, man, I used to love you, but uh, you're you're my worst in round nine. And and Javante right next to him. Don't think you're uh, you're out of the woods because because I kind of hate you too. <laughs> but Najee's two years older than Javante. 
Okay. I'm yeah. going to give Javante the break that, you know, I, he's not, I don't think he's breaking out. I, I think that ship has sailed. Do I think he can maybe remain serviceable? And do I do what happens? He, he's on a year where, where does he go next year? I don't know. Um, Tony Pollard's situation looked bad, but if Javante ends up in a Tony Pollard esque situation next year as a more talented, younger player, it's not the end of the world. Najee had a ridiculous amount of college touches. He has a lot of touches. He went from a really good back to he's just beat up. Not quite as good. I, I don't see the pathway for Najee to be great this season. And I don't see a path to him being good next year at a position. I already don't want to draft. And so I don't want to find myself needing him when there are adjacent players. Cause I'm not just going to completely rip on Najee. I think he's talented. I still think he's kind of maybe slept on and redraft a touch. There's just such a lack of a ceiling at this point, And that's, what's killing me where Monty has a significantly higher ceiling because of the offense. Jalen Warren has a significantly higher ceiling because the injury to Najee and his ability to just do, you know, Ramondre magic uh, in third down situations. You look at Joe Mixon down at 10, four Sig- Why would you take Najee over Mixon when you have a better offensive ecosystem, the ability to actually play meaningful games for your fantasy football team. Najee is just at best. He's the rest of your team has to be so good for Najee to be a valuable piece of your team or something else had to go wrong where Najee was uh, the worst of the least of several evils. When you're talking about a guy like that, Just don't make the mistakes earlier so you end up with that in round nine. Don't do it. It's an ugly pick. Um, And just to honorable mention, not in love with Chris Godwin in Dynasty. Very specifically Dynasty. I actually like him in redraft. I think he's going to have a very good season. My challenge is he's still the wide receiver two on the team. I think it's a team that does want to run the ball a lot because they don't want Baker to throw the ball any more than he has to. Baker is one week away from spiraling off the face of this earth, and we all know it. He looked good <laughs> last year. Sell him while you can and hope yes. he already did. Okay. Yes. Jalen McMillan is phenomenal. I think he has a real shot to not this year, but like next year be like a late breakout Puka. Or, you know, if you find find a better like year two breakout analogy, but Jalen McMillan's the real deal. And I, I think Godwin, if Godwin doesn't have a great season this year. It's uh, it's it's not looking good for him. He's just he's too middle of the road. There are so many good wide receivers in 2024 with this rookie class. I do not want to be investing in sort of middling aging wide receivers. You know, if I'm going to go that route, you know, give me Devonte or something where it really pays off. Yeah. Godwin's too much of a half measure as an aging veteran in dynasty fantasy football. He's a mistake from a game theory standpoint. And that's where I have him. Love him in redraft though, just to save face a little bit. Round nine, Phil. Who's your nasty boys? Yeah, I mean it's Gino, and I feel like all my all my bad, not to say bad, all my least favorite, you know, worst picks have been the the aging quarterbacks. And I mean, look, Sam Howell was acquired from the Commanders this off season, and there was potential that he would even replace Gino as early as this season. I, I don't think that's happening. I do think that Gino is going to be the starter, and barring injury, will be the starter for the season. But the writing's on the wall with the with the acquisition of Howell. And don't rule out a trade for the Seahawks for another quarterback for next year or even using a draft pick. Um, I mentioned I like the offensive coordinator that's coming in. I actually like what the Seahawks are going to be doing. But that doesn't mean that Geno has to be the guy going forward long term in Dynasty for them to do what they're looking to do from a, a you know a more balanced attack. I, I just can't get on board with it. Um, again, if I... I'm in a super flex league. I would take Gino as my QB three, you know, hoping that I've got two other guys that are starters. And then I'd feel great about Gino being, you know, my bye week you know, starter or my, my weekly fill in if I really need someone in a pinch. But it's not someone I'm building around. And it's certainly not somebody that I'm going to actually go ahead and try to target in drafts. Uh, yeah, I'm out. I'm out on Gino. You know, the age, just the the way that I think the writing's on the wall for him. And if my memory's right, I didn't I didn't fact check myself on this, but I think this is the last year or second to last year of his contract. I think it's the last year of his contract. So is it, it avoidable year situation where he might has that. one more year, but it it's might, not it's a fake year? That maybe as sounds more accurate, but either way, it's not like he's signing a brand new deal with guaranteed money. They're not committing to him. That's that's really my point. I totally agree. That's uh, I, I traded him away. I'm not a big fan. He might not finish this year. Might be good for the team. I mean, I'll say this. I actually traded for Gino. I just, uh, hear me out. 
I traded for Geno in a league this year. It cost me a late third round pick that I didn't care about. And the reason that I traded for Geno was I have it's a it's a two quarterback. It's not super flex. You have to start two. I have Anthony Richardson and Jordan Love as my two quarterbacks. I drafted Drake May. So I took Geno as my kind of bridge third quarterback in that super flex league this year because Drake May won't play at least the first four, maybe six weeks, maybe eight weeks. He may not play at all. It just kind of depends. We don't anticipate the Patriots are going to win a lot of games. So I think he'll be like uh, Will Levis, probably play the second half of the year. But I didn't want to go into a season with Richardson Love and really nobody else in that room. So to get Geno to as basically a, a bridge starter until Drake may hopefully develops into my third quarterback that I feel good about. But again, he's still my third quarterback in a super flex and a two quarterback mm-hmm. league. So, yeah, but you're not really buying a quarterback. You bought a bridge to your yeah. actual roster yeah, and exactly. you're a title contending team that just can't afford a major slip up because the rest of your roster is going to stare you at the face. Like, what, what did you do here, man? Give up, give up the second, the third or whatever, go yeah. win a title. Yep. And uh, that's, that's, that's worth it. So I, I agree. Not a big fan as much as I wish that team would do better things. Um, disappointing last year. We'll see what happens this year. Should we finish this thing up? Get to round 10. Let's do it. Let's do, it. Let's do a round 10. Last round of this video. We're going to get through at least a couple more rounds in this video series, though. Uh, I'm going to kick it off. I'm going to steal. I'm going to steal yours. I know we've got a show doc here. We've already agreed that I'm going to steal it. But it's the only time I get to steal this because this is uh, one of Phil's favorite players. But he's. Turned me on to him. I already liked him, but I like him even more. Ricky Pearsall of the San Francisco 49ers. First round, Ricky Big. Absolutely love him. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the short take on Ricky Pearsall. One, already a very talented player on a ridiculously talented offense with aging pieces where he is one of the future pieces that will emerge. And I think him and Purdy are going to be standouts in a year or two on that team when everyone else goes bye bye. Second point, Ayuk Adiba, one or both is absolutely leaving. Ayuk already requests the trade. I think the team would rather keep Ayuk and trade Debo. Debo's kind of, a, he's a functional heart and soul of that team in very uh, uh, non-football ways though too. The point is, we know that one of them or both of them are leaving at some point. So he has a built-in, if that trade happened yesterday, where's Ricky Pearsall's value this year? I mean, it doesn't skyrocket, but it definitely goes up and you look at him as a completely different asset. He's going to be looked at much more like a Keon Coleman than he is Ricky Pearsall on a a fantastic team. So when everything that will and could conceivably happen increases his value, you got to look at him as a smash value because you're not really you're drafting him when you know there's a built in event that's going to give him a two round bump minimum. I like that being built in. And if you have a roster where you don't, or not even trying to win this year, you set up a young team so that year two breakouts can start your window next year. He's just a smash pick. And also don't forget, he's just a ridiculously talented player. He has fantastic hands. Don't count the fact that he might make very valuable catches this year. Not good for fantasy this year, in my opinion, but it's more important as a rookie to make NFL contributions than fantasy. So then in year two, when the NFL says you're our guy, we need you to win games. Then they can really truly come through for you in fantasy. When they have the buy-in of the locker room and the coaching staff, he'll do that in spades this year. My honorable mention, one of your other favorite guys, I'd probably just take your whole take here. I think if you could copy and paste everything I'm saying, you'd be very happy about it. Jalen Warren, what an animal. I think he actually came out with some some workout videos recently. Maybe maybe you know something about that, but he looked pretty good. I saw some some getting steamed up a little bit more. He's he's looking pretty mean. Uh love Jalen Warren. RB one B one A depends on the game and situation for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's talented. He's a good pass catcher. He's extremely explosive. I like that he can run it in from 20 yards out. So Najee won't even get the red zone carry. Um, and I think Russell Wilson has a proclivity for he's he's a weird dude, but he's smart enough that he knows to dump it off. And I don't think he's going to be mobile forever. And I do think there's going to be lots of third down passes to Jalen Warren. I can't tell you how many times uh, as the Chris Carson owner, I saw Russell Wilson actively looking for Chris Carson in places of the field. I didn't think Chris Carson would be like catching 40 yard touchdowns. Love to see me a Jalen Warren, 40 yard touchdown to the corner on a, on a, on a wheel route. That would be fun watching. I think it happens. I'd like me some Jalen Warren. Love it. Uh, mine is baffling. I'm just going to say that the fact that David Montgomery is in the 10th round to me, it, it defies logic. And 
the Lions are not up and coming. The Lions have arrived. And and it to me doesn't make sense why this is not a handcuff. This is not a backup running back. This is a 1A, 1B, and I would even say it's a 1A, 1A.2. You know what I mean? Like it's this there is a there is a defined role for each of Gibbs and Monty in this offense. And while we don't want to speak things into existence, if one of these running backs misses time, the other one I mean, they're, they're both they're both going to finish as RB ones and twos potentially anyway, All right? But to me, it's it just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it's it's a guy who inherited the Jamal Williams touchdown role. Jameer Gibbs is clearly the pass catcher, and we we look we love Gibbs. Gibbs is a first round, if not a second round pick. He can take it to the house, but but Gibbs is not the goal line guy, right? He's going to get some goal line work. We saw that happen, but Monty is the goal line back, and Jared Goff is never. I mean, maybe a QB sneak or like a bootleg once or twice a season. Jared Goff is not Jalen Hurts. He's not Josh Allen. He's not Anthony Richardson. That's vulturing touchdowns from these running backs. So. Monty's going to get his, and at the end of the day, I just don't understand this uh, 10th round. And again, it's it's July. This will change. To me, Monty needs to be going in the 7th or 8th round. If you look at some of these guys in the 7th round, like Tajay Spears is there, Derek Henry is there. I know I liked Henry as a, a value there in the 7th. But to me, Derek Henry should be going in the 10th, and Monty should be going in the 7th. Right? Like, that should be the inverse relationship there. Um, and I don't think you need to worry about you know, Gibbs is going to take the second year leap. Gibbs can take the second year leap and Monty can still be relevant. And I think that's something that fantasy and dynasty players especially need to remember is Monty still has a contract. He's still going to be there. And I wouldn't, I'll be honest, because Gibbs is on that rookie contract and the Lions, I, I think, are probably still going to be in the playoff hunt for the next two to three years. It actually wouldn't shock me to see Monty get a two-year extension on top of his contract. And they just keep that kind of fire and ice or, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, one, two punch, however you want to refer to it. I wouldn't be shocked if Monty and Gibbs stay together in that backfield for the next four years. It wouldn't shock me. So give me David Montgomery in the 10th all day. Um, I have massive exposure to him in the, uh, in the best ball tournaments I'm in right now. He's on a ton of my dynasty rosters to me. David Montgomery is the best. I say that in purpose, the absolute best one B, you know, backup running back in the whole NFL. Amen. He's on my wall. I miss him. I miss him dearly. I like him better than Swift. Why did we have to let him go in division? <laughs> yeah, in division hurts. Yeah. <laughs> Last I mean, year, it didn't hurt when we're not going anywhere in Detroit. Clearly was this year when we're kind of on the ascension. Now it's like, oh, no. Yeah. Ask Giants fans how they're going to feel when Saquon has uh, three or four touchdowns over the two games they play the Eagles this season. They're not going to enjoy that very much at all. So. <sighs> Yeah, you, you know go. the Lions fans are or uh, the Giants fans are doing this year what I was doing uh, last year, the tail end of last year with my Bears. Just drinking a lot. I was and, uh, say, well, they, they get to talk about and... neighbors. I get to talk about Rome, but during a fun season, That's they true. get to talk about That's neighbors true. as like a man. I hope he's doing okay mentally with what. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Man. Oh man! All right, let's get into well, uh, let's get into the the dirt of uh round ten right? Our least favorite picks in round 10. Let's wrap this thing up. Um, I'm not a big fan of Dallas Goddard in the 10th. Um, you know, it, it's just, there's other options around him that I like better. There's some younger upside guys that go a little bit later that I think they'll underproduce compared to Goddard, but I just, I get them for a lot longer. Uh, I don't see Goddard as, especially with the addition of Saquon, you forget Saquon. And I think Goddard, kind of got thrust into this weird, like they have two wide receivers and then Goddard and Hertz very much liked to do a Goddard just kind of found himself open on a lot of just, I, we just need a first down. We'll get it to Goddard. But when I was yeah. watching the game, it just kind of felt like he was, he was very Dalton Schultz like in that. Yeah. You've got a good quarterback and a high powered offense. And sometimes that works for you, but I just don't think that you're the one that's doing everything. I don't think that there's a force that's going to propel you into doing great things. I think your red zone opportunities are significantly diminished on that offense, which tight ends kind of live and die by how many touchdowns they can at least have in the range of outcomes. And his is far too low for him to be very relevant for me. And when I look at where he's going, let's pause for a second. Goddard's not terrible. It's just that 
this year there's a lot of great rookies and there's still rookies here that I absolutely love. And I would punt tight end for several rounds while I get to uh, sweep up, but just to look in round 10, you can still take uh, 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 Williams over on Detroit is still hyper young, has so much room. Ricky Pearsall goes after Goddard. That's crazy. That's just crazy. In, in, in a year, he could be the wide receiver one for San Francisco over a middling tight end. The, Upside next year, this is a dynasty format that you can take in this round and next versus Goddard. It just seems mispriced, and I think he probably could go two, three, four rounds later, and it just wouldn't matter. He's unexciting in a format where you need to make things happen. He's a guy I would buy for cheap to fill a spot. I wouldn't draft him. I would buy him after mistakes were made or bad things happen. And my honorable mention uh, is I'm... Not super in love with Calvin Ridley here from a dynasty format. Um, I think he's going to be very good for redraft, like very, very good for redraft. And, you know, maybe he actually has some pretty significant upside in year two when other things, uh, when, um, who am I thinking of? When, when Nuke uh, probably retires, walks away, something happens. Oh. I just don't think that Ridley has to be good in that offense. I don't think that offense has to be good. I think that, he could have some splash games and then disappear. And he could very much be a better version of Gabe Davis rather than like Devonte Adams. There's too many range of outcomes where he's not consistent enough to love him where he's not really a winner. He's like a piece you add to a championship team, but not a person that gets you to the championship. I don't know. I'm in a weird spot where him, where I like him a lot in redraft, but in dynasty again, it has to do with the names around him. Objectively, he should put up some points in his good and what could be a good offense. But I'm I mean, taking Hollywood more. I'm, I'm taking all these guys who have a lot more. They have more similar upside this year. Hollywood is similar upside, but he's younger and a better offense with a better quarterback. And all, all these guys just have other things going on. So that's kind of where I'm at. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, I think it's okay to like a guy in uh, redraft and not in dynasty. I mean, I think that's a very fair take, right? Like there are a lot of people that love Derrick Henry for this season only in redraft and do not want him on their dynasty teams. I'm actually one of them. I think he's a good value for two years if you've built a certain way. But yeah, I agree with you. I mean, Calvin Ridley to me, I don't know. It's a question of do you trust Levis? Do you trust the offense? Do you think there's enough volume? See, that's too many questions for me. Like that's what I'm I mean. betting there's on Levis. But guys, we got to be honest about i'm a range of outcomes guy we, we both are right but specifically in dynasty um it's yeah. not my take i just i look at what do i think the percentiles that they kind of fall in these buckets and also how many buckets are there realistically and i think there are too many like justin fields disaster of an offense situations where levis ain't good yeah. the o-line got better we think what do you know about O-lines? It's not necessarily about the talent, like an all-star team. Like, like all-star teams don't work. They're all talented. They don't work together. Offensive lines require some chemistry and coaching, even if they're individually talented. I don't know that they're going to come together fast enough or at all. The Bears said they were improving their offensive line every year for like the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> it, it never happened. Yeah, it might never happen. Right. You, I mean, I the fact that that could happen to a guy getting paid that much money, it's a bigger, it's a bigger Tennessee made a bigger mistake signing him than you'll ever make drafting him. So at least yep. you have that, yep. but not my favorite Phil wrap it us up, man. Who are you not loving? Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, man. It's right next to Calvin Ridley. It's Hollywood Brown. Um, I just, I just pulled these stats because I just couldn't believe it. And I'm still having a hard time seeing what about to repeat what I'm seeing. Hollywood Brown has only finished as a wide receiver two once in his career. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I would have said maybe twice or three times. And I would have said, you know, at least one of those seasons in Baltimore. In 2021 in Baltimore, he was wide receiver 24 and a half PPR. That is his highest ever finish. He's only ever been over a thousand yards once. So look, he's 27. He's been in the league five years. He's on his third team. The biggest thing for me is contracts matter in dynasty. And he only has a one-year contract. That's the biggest thing for me. If the Chiefs believed in him so much, and let's remember, I believe, I believe Rasheed Rice had gotten in trouble when they signed him. It may be the other way. Maybe the other way that they signed Brown earlier in free agency before Rice got in trouble, but they still went out and drafted Xavier Worthy. They have Travis Kelsey. I I think he's a player that, you know, if you want to take him, if you've got Mahomes and you know you want to take him in best ball and stack him up for this season, go for it. If it's a redraft league and you've got Mahomes and you want to get some correlation and get Hollywood late, go for it. But in Dynasty, I'm out. 
I'm out on Hollywood and I'm out for two reasons. Number one, we've never seen a higher than a wide receiver 24 finish. I don't care about it. I mean, it's not like he was playing with bums. He was playing with Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray. I mean, let's be honest. Sure, it's not Mahomes, but it's not that far off. It's not like he was playing with Zach Wilson. So, you know what I mean? Like to me, it's a one-year contract doesn't doesn't inspire confidence. So I just don't see look, unless Rashi Rice gets suspended for the whole season and Xavier Worthy's just not the guy, Hollywood's I just don't think he's gonna have the role. You know what I mean? Like, I think Worthy's going to have a role. I think Rishi Rice probably gets four to eight games. At some point, he'll come back. It's always Travis Kelsey's offense. So, yeah, I'm out. It's just not a player that I want on my team. I'm happy to let someone else make the mistake. I won't say mistake. I'm happy to let someone else draft him and give me every other wide receiver you see in this round over Hollywood. Uh, the last one, just really quickly, is Brian Robinson. And, and I need to bring this up because this is important. I understand Washington is kind of a brand new team. We get it. They get a little bit of a free pass with new ownership, new head coach, new scheme. Everything is kind of a fresh reset. But yes, Brian Robinson got shot his rookie year, what, like a week before the season. It, he didn't have competition last year. Don't talk to me about Antonio Gibson being massive competition. I actually think Austin Eckler is a bigger uh, upgrade over Gibson than people are giving Eckler credit for. And don't forget this. And this is why I say it's not a great pick. Who is the run game coordinator in Washington? You know the answer to this question. I do. I do. And he likes Eckler. <laughs> it's Anthony Lynn. Anthony Lynn loves him. Some Austin Eckler, former head coach for the Los Angeles Chargers. He drafted Eckler. He got Eckler. I promise you. We don't have hard knocks with the Washington Commanders. We have it with the Giants. But I promise you, if we had hard knocks offseason with the Commanders, you would see Anthony Lynn in that room with Cliff Kingsbury and Dan Quinn going, get Austin Eckler. So I don't think that this is a backfield that you can separate and redraft. It's going to be messy. And in Dynasty, yes, Eckler is, what, 28 years old. So he's not going to be around forever. But like, look, Brian Robinson, they're not committing to him as the guy. He might be the starter, and Eckler might be the third down back, but don't kid yourself. Eckler's going to get worked in with Anthony Lynn a lot more than Brian Robinson managers want. So I'm out on Robinson. I'm out on Hollywood. I'm happy to let other people go ahead and take them, and I'd rather go get some players with higher ceilings and uh, maybe lower ceilings and higher floors, but certainly some higher ceilings than both of those guys combined. Yeah, yeah. Brian Robinson is going to – the one thing I'll say in his like, – in his, in his, uh, not in his defense. It's more like yeah. what he could be. Because it's not really defending him. It's of all things to inspire you to get better at your craft and really make a push. It's the nicest guy on the planet walking in to be your quote unquote backup, except everybody in the building knows him better than you, thinks he's more talented now than you'll ever be, and treats him with respect that you'll probably never get, Mr. Brian Robinson. Everyone looks at your backup as being better than you and always has been. And you can't hate the guy because it's Austin Eckler and he's super nice and you're probably awesome. going to be best buds with him. I, I think that could inspire Brian Robinson in a positive way to go get really good out of necessity to just not completely cede the job. But I see many versions of the season playing out like we're, we're both in uh, in in sales in, in our professional careers. Um, there's a lot of people that have to you know pound a lot of the, 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 the grunt work and, and tee up a lot of things. And that's extremely important. But I think a lot of us would rather just take the meeting to get the business than make the 20 phone calls to get there. I think Brian Robinson's going to make the 23 and a half yard rushes to get Eckler in a position to score 10 fantasy points. That's I think Eckler's going to have all the high value touches to where Brian Robinson could out snap Eckler 70, 30 and Eckler might still be the better fantasy asset because of the per touch value in a, most dynasty leagues are PPR. And I think that's how that finishes. That being said, nothing against Brian Robinson. It's more of a pro Eckler take if we're being honest and you're just kind of the brunt of the joke. I, I hope good things for him though. I really do. I think, I think he's a good kid and I think he could do something, but he's, he's got to show it. It's got to be better than last year. The guy has to upgrade himself and uh, we'll see. And, we and look, a, a mobile rookie quarterback's not going to. Yeah. I think there's, it's like you said earlier, there's a lot of questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, McCaffrey. Well, yeah. we know one McCaffrey is better than him at, at running back, but shoot, the wide receiver McCaffrey might be better running back than him. Who be, knows? Yeah, we'll out. see we'll how that out. plays out. Be scared. Hey, that was the best and worst picks through 10 rounds. A lot of bonus features, too. I've seen some other content creators kind of come out with this 
type of uh, a video, and I really love it. Uh, if you haven't seen the uh, Big Dog Got to Eat uh, with uh, with Nick Urcolino, they do a really nice version of this. Uh, and I want to give some shout outs to some of the guys that do this probably better than we do. I don't know if their takes are better, but their production quality certainly is. Uh, and, and I think you should definitely go check those videos out. But we've got best, worst, and some honorable mentions. So basically, you have eight. You got you got four good and four bad takes every round through round 10. If you're doing a startup, this really can function as a pretty good primer if you're a little bit loose to the Dynasty Streets or you have your own takes, but you want to temper them and uh, just kind of see if you can find someone, maybe it's us, that you uh, agree with and uh, can kind of can kind of work on that. So hopefully this video series was was helpful. Hopefully it wins you some money if, uh, if, you, if you follow it. I know we Let's have go. followed our own advice quite a bit. And uh, uh, that would be awesome if we weren't in like 20 leagues together. And so only one of us can leave with the title. So we're going to see how that plays out. Phil, it's been awesome having you. Uh, really appreciate your takes. This was an awesome video. I think we want one of our one of our better ones. But before we head out today, uh, you want to tell the people what you have going on and where they can find you? Yeah, so you can see in the top right hand corner here, uh, the extra point with Phil Ruskin every Thursday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 Eastern live on YouTube. Um, you can also find me on Patreon and Spotify. Uh, I'm also a writer for Dynasty Pros. So if you are looking for some articles with written content, some uh, some light toilet time reading, as I like to call it, go ahead into uh, DynastyProsFootball.com. You can check out some of my written content there. Uh, otherwise, catch me on the Extra Point live on YouTube Thursday night, 7 p.m. And of course, you can follow, uh, listen along uh, on Patreon and Spotify. Love being on your show, man. I know you've been on my show, but in fact, you're going to be on my show in about an hour here. So I will uh, go take a quick, <laughs> a quick break, and we'll see you in about an hour, brother. <laughs> Amen. I am looking forward to it. Hey, a quick shout out. Don't want to, don't want to throw any any shade in his name. Uh, Nick Zylak over at the Fantasy Football Advice also has a series very similar best and worst picks. His is, I believe, redraft, not dynasty. But I love. I was inspired a lot by him coming into these uh, uh, content creator streets. So check him out too. One of the big things I want to do on my show is give back and tell you if you found me, but you haven't found all the amazing content creators. I watch way too much of all their stuff, but they're so good at what they do. Support the whole industry. Support everybody. Like and subscribe to everyone who produces fantasy football content because more people will do it, and we'll see some much like the sleepers we like to draft. We're going to see them in this industry as well. So go go like and check those other videos out as well. And while you're at it, maybe like and subscribe to our channels as well. Help us continue the journey. It's been real. Phil, I'll catch you in an hour on the live stream. YouTube has been real. Thanks for uh, chilling at the tavern. We'll catch you in the next one. Cheers. Thanks.